and welcome to the Resilience Podcast. It's Brad Hook here, and today I'm pleased to welcome Janine Beretta Wilburn. Janine is an amazing person who has a story of resilience to share with us. Janine was a global marketing executive, uh, won multiple awards before a car accident changed her life. She's an author who has some amazing tips and tools to share with you today. And yeah, it's my real privilege to say welcome to the Resilience Podcast. Oh, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. and very, very excited about being here. Excellent. So I thought a great place to start is to give our listeners a little bit of context. Tell us a bit about your story. Obviously, I'm fascinated by your work in, in marketing. And uh, and then what, what actually happened that changed your life and changed the trajectory of your journey? It was... Um... You know, it, it's one of those things where I truly, my life changed in a single moment. Um, and at the time I didn't realize it was changing as much as it was. So I was, I live in San Francisco and I was on one of those big hills that you see in, in movies and I'm waiting at a stop sign or stoplight. And I hear that squealing of tires when you hear like someone's, and then I hear the crunch and I'm looking in all my mirrors and then I feel it and I thought, oh, and, I have to admit some bad words went through my head. It's me, I got hit. And it was, I did, and there was no place for me to go. It was no, and um, I got out of the car, exchanged information. My car was still working. I went to a meeting. I was on my way to a marketing meeting with an international toy company. I went to the meeting and people were like, Janine, you just don't quite seem like yourself. I said, oh, I was in a car accident, but I'm fine. And then I went home and later that night, all of a sudden I couldn't stand on my left leg. And things just kind of got worse from there. Um, and what I found out is I had severe spinal damage, um, like all up and down my spine. The worst part was my neck. And as you can tell when I talk, I can move it now. But there's long periods of time where, where I couldn't move it. Um, and in that search, um, unfortunately, this was um, in a time before we knew quite as much as we do about spine. So this was like 25 years ago. And um, they, the more they found out about when they looked deeper at the MRIs, uh, they were like, we, we don't know what we can do. We could try surgery, but we don't think you'll survive the surgery. So um, I was kind of left with a, a really grim prognosis that I would lose movement probably from my neck down. And, um, and that's where I was like, well, that doesn't really work. I'm mm -hmm. too young for this. And um, I had, had just had my son who was nine months old at the time when the accident happened. And I was like, no, no, no. And I just thought if I researched enough, I, that I, there had to be an answer out there. There had to be an answer. And so I was trying all kinds of things. And um, I was, um, but it was, I was seeming to be getting more worse than better. And I was actually considering the surgery. Um, and then I was sitting in my car outside of a grocery, like in a little, little mall outside of a grocery store thinking, okay, as soon as the pain, I can calm it down. I can get out of my car and go to the grocery store. And I was listening to a radio show and on our national public radio. And it was a story. Um, it was a, an author, Sharon Bagley, and she was going over Dr. Richard Davidson's work. Um, and he's from the university of Wisconsin and he is, was, all this work in neuroplasticity. And I'm listening to this and I said, this is what I've been looking for. It's how do I go from using these other tools to actually now in this time for me, how do I, how do I make it work? And um, I managed to get out of the car, but I didn't go to the grocery store. I went to the bookstore and got the book. And that was the start of everything um, where I started researching more about what were things that I could do for myself that could help me heal. Um, and there, they turned out to all be resilience tools, things that help build resiliency. And it, it actually has helped with my healing. So I'm here I am 25 years later. I never lost total movement. The movement I had lost, I've gained back and I've gained so much more. And so what I've wanted to do with that is take that information and put it into tools that everybody can use and understand how to use. And really importantly, how to use them on the hard days, on the days where it's like, you know, this is just feeling like it's getting to be too much and I just don't want to get out of bed or I can't get out of bed. Um, and so that's what, that's what it's culminated. In, and I've been, once I started to, to heal, then I started to create tools that others could use. Mm, amazing. Amazing to be able to get through that 
without going down the conventional path. A few decades ago, people would have said that's impossible. Um, but to find a way, what were some of the, the steps that led you back to, to recovery? Well, some of it was, and I think people might have said I was foolish. Sometimes I said, no, I was stubborn, um, that, that I couldn't, I just wouldn't be able to recover. And I was like, not willing to give that up. I was not willing to give up that I couldn't get some level of recovery. Um, and then one of the first things I, I was, I had started to do yoga um, and yoga is amazing. And, but it also is important who you're studying with. I was, had studied a little bit of yoga before, but I, I found someone who was very um, uh, focused and very, very learned in areas of, that, was, that were helpful for my spine. And so that really made a difference. And I was really blessed. It turned, it turned out to be just a handful of miles from my home. Um, but I tried others and it hadn't worked and I kept trying, I kept trying. Um, and then also I found out in, in what I was reading with Dr. Davidson's work, it was about the value of creativity. And I'd always found creativity a, a place of quite a lot of joy for me. Um, and I was, had been teaching at the University um, of California, UC Berkeley um, in the Berkeley Extension. And so I could take free classes. So I decided here I was losing the use of my hands and arms. I decided to take a class, um, learn how to paint and be an artist. And um, I found, I ended up with the most amazing teacher and she would, even with my limited use, helped me to learn how to express myself through art. And when I would go through art, I used art as a way to deal with pain. It's because I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I'd be so much pain. I would leave everything out in my, my breakfast area and I would just be able to get up. And once I started to able to use the art, I could get out of pain. And it was like, um, you know, when you hear athletes and sometimes performers and musicians, they talk about getting in the zone. And that's when they, well, that's what it's like. I still do art. I've been doing it now for 20 some years. I'd never been an artist before. Um, and, and I'm always surprised. People actually like my work and they want it. I'm like, you can have it. And it's like, no, we'll pay for it. I'm like, no, no, you can just have it. It's like, because I'm just so, because I do it from such a place of joy. Um, mm. And so that led me to go, well, how can I do other things from that place? How, what else can I do? How can I bring that experience um, into other areas? And so then when I started, and also I'm a bit of a research geek. So I just kept researching more and more. What could I find about different tools that people were saying helped with healing? Um, and so what I've done is a culmination of all those, these years of experiments, some that worked, some that didn't, um, and a lot of research. Mm -hmm. um, I love that idea of, flow state that deep immersion that creativity as as a pain therapy because you're out of your mind you're you become the experience and you're doing something you know the research suggests we're 500 percent more productive when we're in flow but it's also intrinsically rewarding you're doing something creative you're creating you're not worrying about the future or ruminating about the past exactly and and as i as i mentioned in my books it's like Instead of, because at least in, in so many cultures, certainly here in the US, a lot of times being creative is about the end product. Mm. You know, what is, what is it the song? Is it the dance? Is it the piece of art? What? And this is like, no, the end product is like the, the cherry on the top of the sundae. It, it's just, it's, it's nice to have. It's really the process. And so whatever you end up with, and, and when I talk to other people who do their work from the flow, they're always surprised. They're always delightfully surprised with what you end up with. It's like, yes. oh, look what we have here. Um, and it's rather than being stuck in the, um, oh, is this the best word choice if I'm writing? Or is this the, you know, is this the best technique? And, I, and in that case, we sort of, um, we start to shut ourselves down um, mm -hmm. rather than opening up. And so that was something that I just found like what what a gift and like I said I found the right and perfect teacher that was willing to uh to help me because she'd have to she created all these things so my hands and arms had something to rest on because I didn't have much mobility then and, um and so I could go ahead and do it and I when I first started I could actually draw a little but I was never good but I do abstract mixed media which makes me laugh because I couldn't create form but it was like but I could tear by going and pulling you know I could I could get it just and I could stick my this part of my hand into the, like a, a medium which creates like glue and then put it on. And so it was just, it was, it was also very childlike and experience, the just joy of 
creating. Creating something. So you're obviously a very creative person. You worked in marketing for a long time, won a number of awards for your for your work. Uh, had you always imagined writing books? You know, I I actually had always wanted to write books. And um, my first, I, I started out as a journalist. And then my first book um, was actually a, a book that I, I did. It's called Sports Families. And um, I had a publisher, we got all the way to, and then it never got published because the big recession hit. Mm -hmm. And um, and I then got into marketing and I also, I think I was a little afraid that, well, oh, maybe it's not good enough or, so I just thought I wanted to get back to, I wanted to write a book, but that was a place where I felt a little bit intimidated about, well, could I do it? Was it good enough? Unlike my art where I had no expectation, I had more trouble doing it with the yeah. books. And then I had this opportunity to, um, to put together the, it's called the Resiliency Guide series, which is all, um, they're all a hybrid of information workbook journal um, to take all this information and put it in. And when that opportunity came up a few years ago, I was like, absolutely, absolutely, I'm going to do this. Mm, so. and, that, and that was your way of documenting some of the tools that had helped you become more resilient. Absolutely. This was, um, these were things that I had shared these ideas and these tools had inspired tools that um, the US military and their family members had used um, for a decade from about 2005 to 2015 or so. And I'd gotten a lots of a lots of wonderful feedback and, and um, had been at some conferences and things. And so I could take and, and build on that. And I was disappointed that they weren't able to continue with the with the programs. But I took all of that learning and said, now what can we do for you know, just something for everyday people that's that would be something usable and this all happened in 20 beginning end of 2019 beginning of 2020 so just before um COVID started to really hit and so like here in San Francisco um within a few weeks of me having signed the, the contract and getting work on it we sh that was our first shutdown and and so things like dealing with loss and what are children going to do and um families and couples who are not quite used to being together so much yes. so it really so it was like what can you do and how do you how do you take these uh, resiliency tools and use them for yourself how do you use them as part of you know your your family and communities and what could it do to help in this moment in time where we're all being challenged in in a lot of ways mm. um and how can we take those challenges and use it for something that um, that actually makes us feel like we, we feel better. It's not like it's not hard. I'm not saying it's, but, but that you actually can feel better in the moment. Um, so that was a lot of the excitement or my joy behind doing it. And what are some of the key tools that have supported you uh, and that you've used in your programs that you've seen be really impactful on people's lives? Um, well, I'll say my first, and it's my personal favorite, is gratitude. And it's funny because um, people think of gratitude as a feeling. And what I like to say, no, it's really a state of being. Um, and it's not just you know, trying to find the silver lining in something that's difficult. No, it's, it's actually being in the moment and finding what, what you are, what something to be grateful for. And that I found by creating a gratitude practice, it was what my, my journal helps to do is create an actual practice, that if you do gratitude statements, I find them that they work most powerfully, though I have no research to prove this, though I'd like to do some research on this, that if you actually handwrite it down um, versus typing or saying it just out loud or in your head, that that's more works more powerfully, at least for me. But that if you have certain times of the day or certain situations, you say, gratitude or write a few gratitude statements that you start to find a shift in your overall well-being and mm -hmm. how you're interacting with the day and how you interact with um, things that come up and what I love about gratitude is that it is highly efficient I like things that are like really efficient how does it get me from point A to point B the quickest so it's like doing it's amazing how when you get used to doing gratitude statements that if something comes up you're in a situation it's maybe you're driving or and someone cuts you off and and you, so the fight or flight comes up a little bit by saying gratitude statements out loud you can calm your system down you can yes. calm it down rather quickly actually so it's like 
or if there's something that goes you know wrong at work and you're you're listening to something that's disturbing it's that you can still listen but run a few gratitude statements in your head and you can find that it's like oh okay and you start to get back to to really your center um and so gratitude's been my mm. really my uh that, that's my favorite and, and it's my favorite not just because I find it fun to do, but sometimes I really don't want to do it. I really don't like it. I'm just like, oh. and that's where, um, <laughs> so we talk to the, the area of practice. That's why it's like, if you find a couple of these tools, and that's why in my book, I have a lot of different tools, you find even just one or two, um, and you put them into your daily routine, mm -hmm. get used to doing them. And if, if it starts out, you know, it comes, becomes sort of a habit. I always tell people, think about your morning routines. Um, because you know, your day just doesn't start right if you don't do all these things that you're used to. Yeah. You know, it, even if it's just, if it's a if it's a cup of coffee or a latte or just you know, and it's like, well, wait a minute. So you want to get some of these things that we're going to talk about. If you put it into a daily practice, it does move. It turns into a habit and it's routine, and then it's, it's almost ritualized. Mm -hmm. It's harder not to do it than to do it. So on those nights when I'm really tired, because I like to do my gratitudes at night before I go to sleep, and I'm like, no, I'm just too tired. This happened last night. I'm absolutely too tired. I cannot do it. Well, on those nights, I'm content if I just write one. Now, nine yes. times out of 10, I'll find out I write more than one, but just writing that one would be like, okay, because it's harder now for me not to do. And it helps. It helps me to go to sleep. It helps to calm everything. It's, um, and so gratitude statements are one of the things that I, I really love. And um, sometimes I, I actually have gratitude cards. Um, some that I've written, other ones that I've made. It's mm -hmm. just anything that can help ease it. So like yeah. with the um, with the service members, they were, the cards were made. On one side, it had a statement they could read and another side's blank if they wanted to add their own. But that way, if you're also really, really having a tough time, if you have a journal or some cards, you can pick it up and read it. And once again, it will calm, it will, it will help create those new neural pathways and move you out of that um, some people refer to as a dark hole or that spiral, yeah. but gratitude statements. That's why I like it can move you out and move people out of that, that difficult space. I love that idea of gratitude as a practice, because what you practice, you get really good at. And eventually you're not going to be consciously thinking, I need to practice gratitude. It's just going to emerge because you've done it enough as a response to some kind of adversity. If I'm about to encounter some adversity and I'm aware of it and I'm in fight flight mode. How can I one remember to be gratitude grateful and and two, what, for example, so I've got a late night webinar and it's starting at 10 pm and I'm a little fatigued and I'm feeling that resistance. How can I what would be a good way to activate gratitude in, in your perspective? Well, that is ex the perfect question brad because that is why so many people get mad at some of these things and they say it doesn't work mm -hmm. um because there's an expectation that at some point it will be easy in those circumstances and in my decades i've not found that it is it's just that i'm more in that morning routine mm -hmm. um but if indeed you have that's why um if you have something written down so if you have a journal of some sort yeah. you can just read them you don't have to generate them you yes. still have to remember to pick it up. So have it in a format that's easy to easy to grab. For some people, that's on their phones. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. It's just, it, it's like, then maybe also, if you're going to write it, write your gratitudes on, on, on your phone too, and then keep it. And then therefore you can grab it and you can read it. So it becomes more, you still have to, to make a conscious choice, but if it's there and it's available, um, mm -hmm. it's easier to make that, it's easier to make that choice. Um, and yes. it's also, you know, people also sometimes feel I get the feedback like, oh, I don't know what to be grateful for. Like they think there's a sort of a right answer to it, or it's supposed to be something important, or it's supposed to be something like world peace, though we will all be very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, it could be grateful. I'm grateful for my favorite ice cream. I mean, it, it doesn't, yep. but what comes behind the four is much less important than the I'm grateful for and just doing the, the whole statement, reading yeah. it out loud um saying it in your head it's just it, it's really so i i actually have some journals that i kind of leave in different places around so i know it's like okay i've got one in my office i've one in my so that that way if i'm in a situation where it's i even keep some in my car because after the car accident sometimes 
if you know something's uh, a little bit short, it, I can trigger into a oh gosh, and it's like okay. And if I if I can't say them in my head, I'll just pull over and I pull my cards out and I read some. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's twenty, sometimes it's thirty. This still doesn't take very long to read, um, and then I'll just find it and be like oh okay, all right, this yeah. is all coming out. I love that idea of leaving these journals around so that you can refer to them. I never thought of that. You know, obviously I've written a few gratitude journals. I, I, I recommend not doing it on the phone if possible, because you, there's always that distraction or the, the possibility of checking something, you know, by default. Um, but yeah, just referring to a, a little book or manuscript or whatever it is near your desk and going, oh yeah, actually those good things. And in that example that I just gave, yeah, you know, I, I have had those moments of gratitude where I go, well, what's the impact potentially if this goes well? Maybe someone will take this tool or take this concept and share it with their child and, and it will have a ripple effect into the world. And straight away, I'm feeling better. And then you give a better performance. But yeah. I love the idea of gratitude as a practice. Uh, what are some of the other tools that you've found to be impactful in, in people's lives, in the work you've done, and in the books that you've written, which we will link to in the show notes? Oh, thank you. Um, another one that I really like a lot is being of service. Um, that it's, it's something that we, we think of um, that we're doing for others, and it's true, we are. But the benefits for ourselves is often even greater. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even been situations where there are people who had expressed um, suicidal ideation um, that have been able to um, make a different choice as a result of being asked to be of service to somebody. Um, it's like, wait a minute. So uh, it's really, uh, as, as humans, we, we like to help others, you know, in whatever way, shape, or form it looks for us. It may not look like the same, but if we can have something like that, that's part of our day or part of our week um, where we're engaged of uh, being of service. And it's also a way to frame, you know, certain things in our lives, like um, parents, and, and now is a tough time to be a parent. Um, it's like, of course, you're doing and giving things to your kids. Like, of course, I'm being. But we often, it's often framed as sort of a duty, versus of being of service. And you can start to go, oh, and you can just are able to witness making a difference. And it, it can make it can be a very something that you think is very very small, and it, it's remarkable how much it can affect somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Something that could be you think maybe. It, small act of kindness. Like people often that, well, then I have to volunteer, belong to another organization. I don't have time for that. But no, you can just say, okay, so today I'm going to do three acts of kindness to people I don't know. I'm just going to do, so maybe it's you let somebody cut in front of you in line yeah. um, or you give up a parking space mm -hmm. or, um, you know, it's just something very, things that you consider very simple, but it's remarkable or even smiling at somebody that you don't know in a way that makes them comfortable. You know, it's like the, those kinds of acts of kindness, those are also being of service and they can make such a huge difference in somebody's day. Mm. Um, it was funny, last week I had to get, go get my new driver's license and here in the United States, the, going to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles can be a long process. I've heard that. And <laughs> we, yeah, we, we ended up, we, had, we were waiting outside, it was kind of rainy, which we were all happy it was raining because we need rain out here. But at the same time, we were all getting really wet. And there was a woman in front of me who was in her 80s and she was with her son and we couldn't wait. And the setup was you couldn't even go in if you had an appointment until five minutes before and you had to wait in the rain. And it was just, it was a really difficult situation when you thought people could get kind of angry and a little mm. snarky. And instead, everybody started taking care of making sure the very next person who was available to go in could go in as fast as they could. And we all got involved in that. And it was so kind. And then when we saw each other in, when we actually all got in and we're taking care of what we need to take care of, people were greeting each other like we had were longtime friends. And the one, the, the elderly woman came up to me and she took my arm. She goes, oh, honey, it's so good to see you again. You would have thought we had known each other a lot more than the 30 minutes we were waiting outside. And it was, and so I, I promised them I was going to post. I said, you know what, it may take me a week or so, but I'm going to put this on my Instagram <laughs> because it was just such a, it was a great experience. And it was like, those kinds of things can make such a big difference in somebody's life and in our own life. Um, and it, it really can make a difference in how we feel during the day. 
Mm. So that's that's another one I really like again because it's also um, really efficient. <laughs> it is it is really efficient, and it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It's small things, as you said. It can be as uh, as simple as just smiling or helping someone pick up a bag. Or and and isn't it interesting that so much of it is related to connection? It's we need it, and we've been missing it over the past few years. And just to be with people collaborating communicating uh, i mean it's such a it's so deeply ingrained in in being human we need that yes mm. it, that, is, that is absolutely right we these devices we have are grateful but i think there's a difference between they help us to communicate yes but it's not always connection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that there's a there's a something missing when we don't we can't make that connection and right and in person it it does help it's Speaking of connection, I'd love to chat about the interviews you conducted, especially with some remarkable people uh, who are a, a little further on in their journey of life and resilience. Maybe you could share a few of those, uh, the, the context and, and some information about BB, I think is her name? B BD. BD, there we go. Yeah. Perhaps so you could share a little bit. Well, as, as you, when you asked me if I was uh, like, other other books. Actually, the book I was pursuing before I wrote the, these journals was about um, how women age, um, because I was having young women ask me, how do, how do women grow old? And I found each time I was asked that I laughed because I said, I don't know. I'm just kind of doing it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, And so I thought, well, why don't I go and ask some women who are older than me? And as I started, everybody, I was getting, asking women, they said, you know, Ask the women over 80. There's something different is what I was hearing over 80. So I, um, I invited a lot of women through, through newsletters to, would they be interested in talking to me? I just wanted to interview them. And um, it was interesting. First, I called it the Women's Wisdom Project and I got almost no responses. And, I thought, hmm. and it turned out they didn't like my use of the word wisdom because they felt they were still learning. Mm. but they hadn't gotten to the place where they would consider themselves wise. I said, okay, I'll take the word out. <laughs> and then it was, um, while I was interviewing them, I was doing it more from a perspective about their, their lives, not about resilience, but yet every single one of these women, and I interviewed like 20, um, they, as they talked about their lives, they hit all these different resilience tools as a key part of what was going on in their life. Now, the, the average age of the women I interviewed was 92, and the oldest was 105, and that was Beatty. And she really, um, she touched my life in a way that I'll never forget, because she was so positive. She said all the time, I have a great life, I have a great life. And here she was, you know, as she was aging, there was things that were limited that she couldn't do. And I, I've, I had a great life, I'm, I'm, I'm a great life. And I thought when I first set up the interview, I thought, well, maybe given her age that she might fatigue in a half an hour, but it was almost two hours. And in that two hours, she had, didn't say anything negative. There was not one complaint, not one thing. Even when she talked about living through different world wars, what she talked about was what, she didn't, it wasn't like a Pollyanna that she didn't understand how awful they were, she did. But she was finding what things she was, did in her life or in people that she loved and, and that's what she was focused on. And it took me all the way to the very end. And I said to her, well, you know, you sound like you've had an amazing life, but is there anything you would change? Is there anything you change? And then she got very specific about from when she was young until the age 12 and they moved that she was experiencing in this small town in the Midwest here, that she was experiencing what we would call you know, racial bias, real racism. And it was like, she said, yeah, I, I would change that. I wouldn't want them to call me that name and spit on me. I was like, wait, two hours, this was good. And she still celebrated that place because when she showed me photos of her 100th birthday, she had big photos of the place and she because what she remembers or what she's taking away with from it. So I have to admit that she's touched me in a way that when I find, feel like I'm having a bad day and I've used some of my tools, but I'm still sort of hanging on a little bit. I just remember, I have a great life. I have a great life. I have a great life. I'm happy to be here. I have a great life. And I just, I'm like, I'm going to beady it, I call it. I'm going to beady it. I love and, that that reminds me to to, to do that mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. so inspiring <laughs> it really is and I, I reflect on on my own travels and 
how you can go to places where people don't have much, like in Bangladesh, for example, and yet there is potentially a lot more gratitude and a lot more, I don't know if you could call it happiness, but contentment and people are connecting with each other and being of service. All of these ideas that you've mentioned, even in the simplest life, the simplest existence, uh, you know, wow, the soup tastes delicious and really savoring it and going, ah, and what are we going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow's a new day. I think some of us need that instead of just being constantly connected to technology, which drags us out of the present moment. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I actually think that's one of the gifts. And I, when I used to hear this before I had my own experience, people would say they, they'd gone through a difficult experience and they'd say there was gifts in it. I'd, Okay, but I, you know, I raise my eyebrows a little bit and think, oh, yeah, there's maybe just a little bit of, you know, uh, they're trying to silver line it. But I actually really feel that way. I feel mm -hmm. like it has brought me into my life in ways that I never would have before. And also, I can appreciate. Um, I, you know, I, I appreciate being being able to do the things that I do, mm -hmm. being able to walk, being able to move, do my art. It's just, um, it's. And I, I really have that appreciation every day. So it's not like, you know, I use all these tools and I, I, I don't think you'd meet anybody that would do this work that would say, oh yes, I'm fabulous all the time. They, they won't, it's not true. But, um, but you know, you, you feel really good a lot more. And, yes. and when you run into the difficult stuff, you get through it in a way that you don't go so low, you know, and it's, um, and I think, Another one of those tools is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And um, when we, we think about, and you, we even hear stories about where some harm's gone to somebody and they, they've forgiven that person. But it was like sort of one of the keys of forgiveness is, is the biggest gift is not just forgiving that person, but the gift to ourselves. Because we're saying, I'm not gonna carry this anger and resentment and hurt. I'm going to let it go. What happened happened doesn't make it right. Doesn't mean you have to forget. Absolutely. No, don't, you don't have to forget. But you don't have to hold on to the hurt. It doesn't protect us. It doesn't keep us safe. It's like letting it go is also one of those things that's amazing to say, you know, wait a minute. And it, what's really interesting and in what I've found in, in, in my books, I have sections where I start out with forgiving ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we do forgiveness. I forgive myself for, because you know, we often will be hard on ourselves. So I should have done this. I could have done that. I would have done, you know, and, and get rid of all the could have, would have, should have. Yeah. Forgive yourself. And then you start to see what else it opens up. And sometimes it's sharing the forgiveness with people. And sometimes it's not. It's just for yourself, yes. um, you know, to, to, to let it go. So that's yes. another one. Great tools. That's a great tool. That's almost the base camp on the journey of growth is, is start with yourself and then you can move forward and start practicing some of the other tools. Love that. What really excites you? What's part of your vision for the, for the next few years? What are you focused on achieving? <laughs> well, you know, that is really something that I've been talking about. Um, I, I use a a word that I've made up that sounds like it belongs in um, like a children's book, but I add the the, um, the suffix ness to my name. I, I'm my Janine ness. It's like what is really my Janine ness? What, what who am I? What am I about? And what lights me up? And as I'm looking at this really next chapter in my life, at this point in time, I'm going. What is it that I want to do? What is it I want to live? So I know that I want to continue to do my art because I really, with writing the books, I didn't have done much art. So there's a joy to my art. So I want to continue to do that for myself. And I'll continue to practice yoga and do my gratitude journals. And I meditate every day. So I'm going to keep using my tools. But I really would like to share this, get this information out because it has made a world of difference in my life um, in, in ways that it, it's like, as people know more about not just the accent, some other things and be like, what are you, what are you, are you kidding me? How can you, and I'm saying, because I have these tools and, and there's, and there's science behind it. Now I'm not the scientist. I can understand it. And I, I read the, like I said, I'm a research geek, but it's like, how can you make these things real in your life so that your day-to-day -day life is better? Mm -hmm. that you, you enjoy it more. Um, uh, you feel more peace, more calm. And, 
and we all have to go through difficult times and it's just can we go through them in a way that's um a little bit easier a little bit yeah. smoother a little bit softer it doesn't it doesn't take it away i mean it's you know but when I had four physicians yelling at me, do I understand that I'm going to be not moving from the neck down? I probably will never forget that. I understand what they wanted to do. They, they thought I wasn't understanding them because I wasn't jumping to the surgery. So they had my best interest at heart. But that was, that was a scary moment. I don't think I'll ever forget it. But at the same time, it, was, it didn't freeze me. I didn't go to a place. That I didn't go into the fight, flight, or freeze. That, Sometimes that's really helpful. I'm not saying to ignore that. You need our, that response. But it's, it's when you're in difficult times. Last, uh, what was it, February, February, March? I can't even remember now. But when there was the huge volcano and there were tsunamis that were going on all over from that. Well, I literally live right across from the Pacific Ocean here in San Francisco. Okay. And um, I got a, a phone call actually from friends in Switzerland saying, do you, should you leave your house? They were, they were worried because it was early and they were getting more information than I was. And then they were, there were um, police officers and things going up and down the, saying, hey, you know, this could be coming. And it was like, you had about a short period of time to pick up and leave. Um, and it was like, it was an advisory. And they said, well, you don't have to leave, but it's an advisory. And then someone called me and said, I, I'm seeing data. I worked, there was a friend that worked on the uh, my son's friend actually was, and we're saying, please, we'd feel better if you leave. So we left. And it was like, we could just go as, as a disturbing of a moment and time that is. We left. We actually went to higher ground. We found breakfast. We went to book shopping because we both love books. And we could just wait, wait the time out and just feel grateful for being safe. Yeah. And um, it was like, wait a minute. This could have been something that could have just you know, shut me down or shut anybody down and be like, wait a minute. And there'd be fear. How can you go back there? And but it just, it gives you that. It gives you so many more tools. It gives you more choices. It opens up your life um, in a way that you don't know. You, you don't completely know until you start to do it. You, you'll know it from other times you've had it. It's like, wait a minute, yeah. I can face things that are really um, normally frightening and I can do it from a place that's empowering to myself. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's, a great feeling. It really is. And knowing that you're equipped for those situations going forward, you're, you're not going to sweat the small stuff. You can take action. And I think that's what it's about. It's in those times of adversity, being down the spiral, knowing that you've got some tools to just bounce forward rather than back potentially, which is what we talk exactly. about. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And, and knowing that, like I said, designs make them easy to use. It doesn't make life perfect i call this the earth school we all get to go through things um, yeah. we're always learning right yeah. but you you're able to to approach it and sometimes they'll be like okay i'll do the gratitude it's not working the same then i'll try okay well i'm gonna be of service or i'll try compassion i've got some forgiveness statements it's like um wait a minute i'm gonna you know just step over here and just do a yoga pose that i can do even in public where people don't really notice, I'm just doing a certain kind of uh, standing pose. Uh, yes. Sadasana, and it's like, what can I use? What are the tools I can use? Because sometimes I need a one, sometimes I need more. Some work better than others, depending on the situation. But it, I think the best part about it is that it, it feels empowering, but not from a place of ego. It feels empowering like, okay, I got this. I'm gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that's so important. I think a lot of resilience training, formal resilience training uh, originated in the military because they realized people needed to be able to juggle these skills and use the right one in the right moment, in the right context, um, which some might call situation agility. You know, okay, this isn't working. I'll switch to that one. But before you get to that point of being agile, you need to have being playful, I guess, and learn these skills and give yourself some space and realize that they are worthwhile. And as you start to get those small wins, you build other ones into your practice. And eventually you are quite agile in the moment. So I guess it's a journey of discovery, isn't it? It is. And it's, um, I'd say a lot of the time, I think it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. Yes, it should be. It's not. And it's like, you're like, oh, you know, it's, I tell folks that I work with individually, I'll say, okay, so then if you like get to the point where like, 
she does not know what she's talking about. I'm mad at her. I'm like, that is perfect. And they, they always laugh and they go, how oh, could that be perfect? It's because that's when you know you need it the most. Mm. So that can be a trigger. So when, now that you know that, it's like when you feel that way, it's like, oh, this is really going to be helpful now. I'll notice the help more now. And um, yeah, so that it's, you can, again, mm. take it on and say, let me and- do it. What are a few of your favorite books or podcasts? Who do you admire or follow? Okay. Well, I actually have it here because I wanted to make sure that it was like, um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Richard Davidson and his work out of the Center of Healthy Minds. I, I love his work. I've been following it for decades and his work with the Dalai Lama as well. It just, um, he's done a lot of, a lot of books um, and they're all, they're all amazing. Um, uh, Dr. Robert um, Emmons, um, he's out of the University of California, Davis, and he's done a tremendous amount of work on gratitude. And his, um, some of my favorite quotes, and some of them are, are rather long, but um, where he just really distinguishes what gratitude is and how it's more than a feeling mm. and it's what an opportunity it, it provides. So it's not just like, oh, this is a, um, you know, it's sort of a, woo woo feel good thing he's like no his work is great um and then rick hansen um he's done a lot of a lot of work mm. those are like probably my top my my top three favorites and if you look at any of them their their work is just so extensive it there's is. more but it's just those three i think do a wonderful job of covering off so many of the the different bases and i recommend um in, in all my journals i have have recommended reading in, in the back and go into some more details about certain areas. But yeah, oh, there's really, uh, there's a lot out there right now. Um, and it's worth finding, um, it, it's worth taking, reading it, checking it out, listening to it. It's, mm-hmm. it's worth it. There are so many ways for people to connect with content nowadays, including this and books and YouTube videos and TED Talks. And I think, finding what works for each individual, what inspires you and what equips you with some tools. But then there is that very real knowing doing gap where I can know a lot of stuff, but what do I actually practice? Any tips for people who want to take on board some of these tools, but they don't know where to start? What I would, where I'd recommend starting is to pick one, you know, uh, just just pick one and and give that a try and how to you can either go to any of the resources how you as you mentioned there's so many different ways to to research something or even if you're like after listening to this you're like well i don't know if i want to go that far just and then i would just suggest that for one week ideally it'd be two weeks but i know from from experience it's hard one week people will step up they'll try it and that one week you decide I'm going to five time or one time a day, I will write five gratitude statements or I will um, and just and pick the time of day and try to do it always at the same time. And the reason I say that is because then I love these things. It's like, um, I call it a double dipper. It's doing two things at once. Um, you're also beginning to start to build a practice. So it makes it easier Um if you do it, if you can start to do it at the same time or decide that you're going to do five acts of kindness to people around you, your loved ones, strangers, it doesn't matter, five acts of kindness. Um, Or you're going to breathe, just watch your breathing, sit quietly, watch your breathing, set your timer, five minutes, breathe. um, Another thing was like, okay, I need to move. And you know, when we're we're so much more in front of these screens, we're not moving as much. So it's, I'm going to take, and it can really just start out five minutes, but get out, leave wherever you, you are, whether it's a, 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 your home or your office or what, and, and just even for just five minutes, every day at the same time, walk. So it's just, it's taking something and just getting yes. started and do that every day for a week. And then at the end of the week, see if you can't do it for another week. Um, and do that see if you can't do that for a month and you will be surprised especially when you pick a time oh you will be asked to do more phone calls or something at that time like don't be surprised that can come up but then see if you can just say no wait a minute I'll I can do it five minutes later so it's just something that 
So you just start doing it and you'll find that it really, really can make a difference. And also you can do sort of what I call the buddy system. If you have somebody close to you or um, um, that you can say, let's do this together. And then you can kind of help hold each other accountable. So that way it makes it easier on the days you don't want to do it, mm -hmm. uh, to do it. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, wait a minute. I need to check in. I have a, a lot of folks who I do that with gratitude. They send me gratitudes every morning and every night. And um, if I don't hear from them, they know they're gonna get a text from me <laughs> asking where it is. Um, mm -hmm. And it just helps them to build a practice. And then that practice is something that you know, becomes, becomes um, eventually a ritual, a part mm -hmm. of their life. And um, they notice that again, they're noticing difference. And the reason you keep, you'll start to notice it for yourself. You don't have to believe me. You'll start to notice yourself like, wait a minute, things are just, and, and you're, you'll try to look for like a cause and effect. And you, you can't always draw the direct line. It's just, but you'll just notice things are working a little better or you're responding to things a little easier. It's just, you will start to notice, um, you will start to notice it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have one, um, one person who's, um, he's been doing this for, uh, for a, a handful of months now. I have some that have been doing it for, oh gosh, I'm going on like six, seven years, eight years. Um, but what I, I ended up hearing from um, some of his family members about how he was giving voice to it. And so they reached out to me because they saw such a shift in him and they were like, tell me about this, teach me about this. Because he said, this shift is due to this. And it's just three in the morning, three at night. That's it. Love it so much. And I really like that idea of accountability as well. Imagine if, if we all found some kind of resilience buddy who or a gratitude buddy who we just sent that message to and they get to see it as well i mean it must have some kind of positive impact on the recipient and then you send one back and as a collective we're all just acknowledging the good things in in our lives hunting the good stuff right and and, and we know from the neuroscience we're, we're building new neural pathways that yeah. are helping us overall in all areas of our life that uh, so mm. yeah I love that you know I, I can't believe I never thought of that term but yeah that gratitude buddies or resilient buddies I love that term that I like that what that creates thank you <laughs> Well, I love the term Janine-ness. I think that's amazing. <laughs> and I'm, I'm already starting to think, hmm, how can I tap into my Bradness <laughs> uh, or Bradley-ness? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I love that as well. well. That's, that's interesting. So I didn't mean to interrupt. No. That's interesting. What if that's different? Exactly. It probably <laughs> is. It probably is. Bradley is when I'm in trouble, Brad. <laughs> oh, so we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that separately. <laughs> Um, now, this has been a, a, an amazing conversation. I'm sure we'll do a part two at some point because there, it's, it feels like there's so much more we can explore. Uh, for people who want to connect with you, who want to look into your books, these gifts you've created out of you know, your own spirit, your own creativity, how can they find out more? Um, you can go to my, my website, uh, JanineBerettaWilburn.com. And I think you're going to have the, the link on that. And you'll find more information about resiliency. Um, there's a lot of um, sections you can click on and it'll give you more information. And also you could purchase, you. there's links to buy any of the books at any of your favorite booksellers. So um, for, for each of the books, so you can go there. And there's also a way to reach out to me if you'd like to. Um, so it's, we have it all there. And eventually we'll have this podcast on there too. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts for people out there who have just uh, listened to the conversation? You know, I just want to say, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, you can do this too. You can do this. It's like, sometimes people think, oh, uh, you must be really resilient and you're really special. And so I think maybe it's a little stubborn, but <laughs> I just want to give up. <laughs> but, but honestly, this works for everybody and you can do it. Absolutely, you can do it and bring more joy and light in, into your, your life and the life of your ones, people you care about. So I just, I know it. I just know it, that, that you can do it. You can, we can all be resilient. We can all be resilient. Love that so much. 
Thank you so much, Janine. I really appreciated spending some time with you today. And Brad, thank you. Oh, sorry, Brad, thank you so much. I so enjoyed being here. And it's just delightful having this, this conversation with you and being able to share this with, with all the folks that listen to your podcast. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Do check out the links in the show notes, and we'll see you next time on the Resilience Podcast. See you guys.